Hello, friends. Do you want to grow your own veggies, fruits, and herbs, but don't have space for a full garden? Or maybe you want an attractive place to plant some decorative flowers and add a little curb appeal to your home. Then you're in the right place, because today we are going to be building a DIY planter box using some beautiful cedar boards. We will also be testing a new exterior finish for these boxes, and you won't believe how it turns out. We built these first two boxes two years ago when we started our blog, but we've learned a lot since then, so it's time for a refresh. The biggest issue we've had with these boxes is the finish and the corners. You can see here how the finish we used has failed to prevent the cedar from graying in some spots and has preserved it in others. We started by updating our plan set and instructions with everything we've learned in the last two years, so if you want full details or to buy the plans for yourself, be sure to head over to our website and check it out. We'll leave those links in the description below. Let's start with wood selection. After having a good plan, this is the second step to any project, and it can make or break the project. I realize that they call these premium boards, but you're in the wrong aisle. These softwood boards will split, warp, and rot in no time if we use them for a planter box. We don't want to rebuild this box in a year, do we? So we're going to need something more durable. Instead, we'll be looking for a rot-resistant wood like cedar, but these premium cedar boards are ridiculously expensive. Normally you could use pressure-treated lumber for ground contact use, but you don't want that near the roots of your produce or herbs, so let's head over to the decking section. The first boards we got were unfinished on one side, and most of them were slightly cupped. That's what happens when you buy the cheapest option. Pay for a slightly nicer board, and then spend the time to check each one for straightness and flatness. Hardwood dealers will usually have better quality boards, but you can often find cedar at big box stores like this as well. These ones were marked as being 5 quarters, but they were really only a hair over an inch thick. This works for us though, because then we can plane them down on both sides to make them 3 quarters of an inch and ensure that they are flat. Bring the materials list from the plans with you to make sure you get what you need. Load up your cart, and then bring them all home. Once you have the boards home, lay them out on your workbench and decide what faces you like the most. Mark up all the boards and label everything so you can match them back up properly later. If you bought longer boards or are building smaller boxes, try to lay out the cuts so you can wrap the grain around the corners for a beautiful effect. To help speed up the layout, you can clamp the boards together and use a large square to mark up multiple boards at once. Since we are going to use stop blocks later to ensure everything is consistent, we have a little wiggle room here. Once everything is laid out, we're going to start by rough cutting everything on the miter saw. This gets everything down to its individual pieces and makes the boards easier to manage. Just make sure you cut on the right side of your line. Don't let your mind go into zombie mode halfway through, or you may end up having to shrink your design by an eighth of an inch and trim everything all over again. That's definitely never happened to us. Nope, never. Certainly not on this exact project, on camera right about now? All right, so mistakes were made, but nobody has to know. I mean, besides everyone who has watched this video, I guess you all know. Hmm. Moving on. Next, we're going to run these boards through the planer really quick to clean up the faces like we talked about. If your boards are already three quarters, you can skip this step. If your boards have any significant cup or twist though, make sure you watch the first part of this video again, and then go back in time and make sure you buy better wood. Or use a jointer or a planer sled to flatten them out if you have enough thickness that you can salvage it. By the way, all these wood shavings make really great mulch for garden beds or planter boxes. Hooray, free mulch! Next, we head over to the table saw. Last time we built these boxes, we cut these corners on the miter saw. That worked all right but it's not perfect. There's enough flex in our miter saw that we can move the angle by hand. This means that getting crisp miters is very difficult. If you don't have a table saw, or you have a much nicer miter saw, then that method will still work. But we wanted to ensure that our corners are nice and tight this time around, and for that, we'll be using a crosscut sled and setting our blade to just past 45 degrees so that there is no gap in the outside edge of our miters. 
we built this giant sled to put miters and chamfers on the massive panels for our headboard build. If you haven't seen that video before, then check out the link at the top of this video or down in the description below. The great thing about using a crosscut sled like this is that you can set up stop blocks. This helps ensure that the boards end up being the same length. For these longer boards, we clamped our side support table to our table saw and then set up a stop block on there. Just make sure the stop block is no longer touching the board when you make the cut so it doesn't cause any binding. The rounded profile that we have on our stop block helps prevent that. Then, after you've set it up the first time, it takes no time at all to make all the cuts on the rest of your boards. Once all of the side panels are cut, we're going to go ahead and glue them up. We don't own a domino, but we do have a biscuit joiner, and I've always wanted to try using that to help with alignment for these mitre boxes. However, I quickly realized that I have no idea what I'm doing, so I did what anybody would do, and I headed to YouTube. I mean, that's why you're here, isn't it? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I watched a YouTube video on this a long time ago, and I'm pretty sure I remember most of the key points. What's the worst that could happen? Oh, that's not good. Alright, so this is why we do a test piece. Even here on this second clip, as I'm pushing the blade in, I shifted up the slope slightly and made the notch higher than the first one. This caused the joint to be misaligned, so I ended up with a wonky joint like this. It holds itself together really well though, so it will make glue up a lot easier. It's just going to take some practice to get the technique down. And since this isn't a piece of furniture, it's a great time to practice. I went ahead and cut this notch into all the boards and ended up with about an 80% success rate. For the ones where I drifted, I just came back and made the cut again. The biscuit will be a little sloppy, but it will aid slightly in the assembly. Hey, live and learn. We're now ready to start the glue up. We start by evenly coating each face of the joint with glue to ensure we get good penetration and a strong joint. This is especially important on mitered corners since they are practically end grain. We then fit the boxes together and those biscuits make this super easy. For mitered boxes like this, we like to use strap clamps or ratchet straps with corner blocks to get good pressure on all of the corners. We 3D printed these corner blocks to convert our ratchet straps and they work pretty well. I'll make those files available with the link below. You just run the strap around the perimeter of the box and crank it down tight. The corner pieces help ensure everything is square and the biscuits keep the corner edges pretty well aligned. Now, the eagle-eyed viewer may have noticed that we got into a groove and ended up making a terrible mistake here. One that we actually thought about ahead of time and even included as a tip in the script before we even started this project. Have you spotted it yet? No? Well, let's let the future Tyler tell you what went wrong. So, now that everything is nice and glued up, it's about the perfect time for me to realize that I use Type Bond Original. It even says it right on the label, interior use, which is why I bought this. Did I use this? No. No, I didn't. So. Bollocks. After realizing the mistake, the ideal scenario would be to re-glue these with the correct glue. We'd heard that you could heat the pieces up to weaken the glue and then bust them apart. Wham! Bud! Smack! Let this be a testament to just how strong wood glue is. If we keep going here, we will destroy these pieces, so we're going to need a better solution. On our original planter boxes, we never glued the corners. We just used screws to hold them together. We could do that again here, but we don't love the way the screws look. So we're going to try something a little fancier. We're going to add splines to the corners. A spline is basically a strip of wood inserted into a matching groove along the edges of two boards. These not only look cool, they also greatly add to the strength of a mitered corner. To do this, we can quickly make a jig that will hold our box at a 45 degree angle and slide along our table saw's fence. We start by cutting two strips of plywood and then attaching them to a larger piece to create a frame that hugs the fence. There was a little bit of play in this fit, 
so we added a few strips of tape to fill in the gap. Next, we attached two pieces of scrap wood to the ply at 45 degree angles, and we're ready to cut some splines. Assuming it clears the ceiling. Hmm. Alright, time to take this show on the road. I'm sure our neighbors think we're nuts, but this is going to work so much better. Can we all just take a minute to appreciate how ridiculous this looks? But it works so much better than I expected. We just have to set up the fence where we want the splines to fall, run all of the corners through, flip the box over, and then run them through again. Nothing to it. It's always worth it to make a jig. Next, we cut some wood pieces down to the right thickness and length, and then glue those into our slots with the correct wood glue this time, aka the exterior rated type bond 3. Once the glue dries, we come back with our pole saw and chisel to trim them flush. A great tip here is to tape off the teeth on the opposite side of your saw, so you don't accidentally scratch your piece. Beautiful. These are gonna look great. Now that the boxes are done, we can cut the interior pieces to their final dimensions. We waited to do this until now, just in case something happened during the box build that would affect these pieces. Like, say, cut on the wrong side of a line, causing you to have to make all of your boards slightly shorter. We stacked up the boxes and the bottom boards and measured the inside width and height. I'm just kidding. Remember this tip. Never measure if you don't have to. Instead, we took our actual pieces of wood for the interior supports and marked the correct height and width on them directly. This will be much more accurate, and it's faster as well. Then it was over to the table saw where we set up our stop block and cut all the pieces to their appropriate lengths. Nothing to it. Finally, we chopped the bottom boards to their final width and lengths as well, and then drilled a bunch of drainage holes in them. These holes let excess water flow out of the planter box more easily, which keeps our plants happier and makes our wooden boxes last longer as well. A quick test fit later and we are looking good. All that's left are the boards for the top piece. These boards also have mitered corners that we want to ensure are accurate. So we place a square against the back fence of the crosscut sled, clamp the board down, and cut it to a perfect 45 degree. Since we can't set up a good stop block for these, we made sure to take extra time to ensure they ended up the correct length. Once we had those done, we just had to glue them together with our strap clamp. Don't worry, we remembered to use the correct glue this time around. And we're done with all the pieces. Time to make it pretty! We start our finishing process with one of the most important steps, sanding. I know, I know, nobody likes sanding. I hear you. That's why we recommend you get yourself a good orbital sander and use the 3M Extract Sandpaper. Link below. This stuff is amazing and it makes sanding go so much faster. Try it. Seriously. And because we want this to look extra fancy, we're going to water pop between grits as well and sand the exterior faces up to 180 grit. Then, we quickly vacuum the dust off the boards and wipe them down with mineral spirits to clean them. To help the boards dry faster, we set up a fan and then left them to sit overnight. We want them to be completely dry before we apply our finish. When we first made these boxes, we had just finished our live edge table the previous year, and we really liked the way the grain had turned out on that project. We used a combination of boiled linseed oil and mineral spirits to warm the wood and bring out the grain. Then we'd finished it with polyurethane to protect it. We never liked polyurethane, but it does provide pretty good protection, especially against toddler sticky fingers. So, when we went to do those planter boxes, we treated the wood with the same boiled linseed oil and mineral spirits, and then sealed them with spar urethane, which holds up better to UV exposure than polyurethane does. That worked alright, but we were never really happy with it. Fast forward a few years, and we've been using Rubio Monocoat on our projects, and have absolutely loved the results. 
check out our modern bed or headboard videos to see how beautiful those look. So, we knew we wanted something just as beautiful this time around. We reached out to Rubio and they recommended that we try their hybrid wood protector for this project. They thought it would hold up really well and we wouldn't have to worry about chemical leaching. So we decided to give it a shot. This product goes on a little differently than their Oil Plus 2C does. After cleaning the wood surfaces and letting it dry, you start by stirring the oil and then measuring out the amount needed. Since this is going to be used for a planter box, we are going to add about 10% per volume of the hardener to the mix. So for 100 milliliters of product, you would add 10 milliliters of hardener. Then we mix it up and we are ready to start. We begin by applying a layer of the hybrid wood protector with a flat brush. Then we leave it to react for 10 minutes before coming back with the same brush to smooth the surface. We're not applying any new product here, we're just smoothing it out. Then we let it sit for another 5 minutes before using a rag to buff off the excess product. All that's left now is to let it dry. The product will be ready to handle in about 24 hours and completely cured after 7 days. I have to say, these boxes are looking pretty amazing. We are excited about the results, and if this holds up, it will definitely be our current favorite exterior finish. That said, we are going to be trying out Rubio's Wood Cream on another build very soon here, and that product holds a lot of promise too. If you want to see how the Wood Cream finish turns out, then be sure to subscribe to our channel so that you can catch that video when it comes out. And let us know in the comments down below if you'd like a follow-up video on how the different Rubio finishes are holding up in a year or so or if you'd like us to make an instructional video on how to apply these finishes. Once the finish has dried enough for handling, we can go ahead and put the planter box together. This assembly is super simple, so the box goes together very quickly. We start by screwing together the internal support pieces. Then, we assemble the pieces of the box and drive screws from the inside. We used inch and a quarter screws to make sure that we didn't accidentally break through but we drive them from the inside to ensure that they are hidden from view. We drill some angled pilot holes for our pocket screws and make a recess for the heads to fit into. Finally, we drop the frame on top and attach it with the pocket holes from below. All that's left now is to move the box into place and fill it up with rocks and soil. We start with a base layer of larger gravel a few inches deep to aid in drainage. Then a smaller layer of pea gravel to help keep the soil out of the larger gravel. If you have landscape fabric, you can throw some of that on there as well. Just make sure the fabric is permeable and allows water to flow through it. Otherwise, you just made a bathtub and likely your plants will die from sitting in the water too much. Then, we fill the planter box up with a rich organic soil blend, and we're ready for plants. Quick tip here, you can save a lot of money and cut down on plastic bag waste by buying your soil in bulk from a local organic recycler. These are companies that convert food and yard waste into compost for resale. Check Google to see if there is one in your area. It's amazing what a difference time can make for a DIYer. We love how this turned out compared to the previous planter box. Nothing is truly wrong with the other one, and it's totally fine to build it the way we did. But it's really cool to see our growth in DIY. I know it's just a planter box, but it's meaningful to us. And obviously, we still make mistakes. Hint hint, using the wrong wood glue. But that's part of learning and getting better. We want others to grow their skills like us, which is why we started this channel. Even if you're worried because you've never tried to build something, or make something before, acknowledge that, do some research, learn, and get started. Our best advice is just to start and try it. We can all do amazing things. You will get better, but only if you aren't afraid to start. Take chances, make mistakes, get messy. Oh, 
Wait, that's Magic School Bus's tagline. Huh, well, it still applies. If you've enjoyed this build, then you'll probably enjoy seeing one of our other build videos. I recommend checking out our modern bed by clicking on that tile on the screen. Thanks for watching.